So good afternoon everybody. Good afternoon here in Europe. So good evening in the Philippines. So welcome to another episode of um, Kinetics College uh, lecture series. So my name is uh, Emilio Gomez. So you can call me Emil for short. And I represent um, IPASS Online Review and Academy. So thank you for um, joining me this evening. So as we go um, further on uh, 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 diving to into what we call the next generation NCLEX. So today or um, tonight we will be uh, I will be doing uh, a lecture series uh, lecture discussion about what we call the bow tie. So in this um, lecture, I'll be uh, going to um, give you some tips and strategies that will help you further um, understand the dynamics of this question, if ever you will be able to um, encounter this uh, particular um, question in the real NCLEX. So I believe some of you are, are having a questions, uh, different questions about um, the NCLEX, some of you um, is like skeptics in terms of what should I uh, really encounter during the actual NCLEX examination. And I'm telling you, worry no more because um, I pass in collaboration with Kinetics. We are doing a lecture series every uh, third Monday of the month to ensure that we uh, help our students not only on their journey toward uh, uh, in America, but rather preparing you holistically on the things that you really need to, to, um, to have or to gain as a knowledge for you to effectively manage your um, review during your entire preparation for the NCLEX. And what we are hoping right now is for you to pass your NCLEX at least first attempt. So without further ado, let me introduce again myself. My name is Emil Gomez. I'm currently um, uh, uh, stationed or located here in Hamburg, Germany. So I am a cardiothoracic intensive care unit in one of the uh, uh, famous hospitals, in uh, a level one uh, trauma hospitals in Hamburg, Germany. So back in the Philippines, so I was part of St. Luke's Medical uh, Global City as a clinical nurse educator and nurse unit manager. And I was uh, part of a various uh, um, educational institutions like in the University of Makati. I became one of the uh, faculties. So also I was part of the um, um, review center of radiologic technologies back in the Philippines. So I decided to, to um, uh, leverage further my nursing profession. So currently I'm, I'm here in, in Germany. So in the, in, in the next few months or hopefully this year, I'll be applying also to United States. So please also uh, uh, pray for me. So without further ado, let me um, discuss you uh, my lecture. So what is the topic for this evening? So how to answer NGN standalone questions. So specifically, we will be dealing about bow tie or what we call um, the standalone, one of the standalone questions in NGN. So I'll be going uh, to discuss with you some of the most important tips and strategies for you to effectively answer this particular standalone question. So as part of our learning objectives, you will be able to, uh, we will be discussing quick overview of the NGN question types. So review of standalone questions, so specifically we will going through on reading um, or, or lecturing about trend items and bow tie items and discuss you scoring types for um, standalone questions discuss tips on answering standalone questions and learn about certain disease conditions. So we will be applying, um, I will be doing a, a certain lecture of a, of a particular condition. So after doing it, we will be applying it to a one question about a bow tie. So, so that we will be able to um, analyze if we gain something about the lecture and effectively utilize these informations for us to manage answering this bow tie. So apply tips learned in answering standalone question example, which is particularly we will be dealing in bow tie. 
So as we all know, um, coming April 1, 2023, I think uh, uh, a month from now, we will be transitioning to what we call the next generation NCLEX, so to speak. So the basic reason why we have this NCLEX transition from a normal NCLEX to what we call the next generation NCLEX, the focus of this is basically to measure the clinical judgment ability, the clinical judgment or what we call the cognitive thinking ability of the nurse in terms of, of how our nurses effectively uh, render nursing in the USA. So for the past couple of years, there are a lot of questions with regards to the re to the to the idea if the NCSBN or the NCLEX is really measuring the ability of the nurse if they can uh, effectively uh, um, use their what we call critical thinking, their ability on effectively use these different cues informations to effectively manage their patient. So. As part of the training, also as part of the research of the NCSBN, they have this next generation NCLEX that, it, uh, that usually or aims to measure the clinical judgment or the cognitive thinking skills. So what are the things that we are expecting for this next generation NCLEX? So we have here a case study. So basically, we will have this 25% more questions, new questions on NCLEX, which primarily focus on two types, which is case study based and the other one is standalone case. So meaning to say the 75 questions are still coming from the old one and there will be an integration of the new um, format of the test, which will focus on the case study and the other one, as we, as we all know, is the standalone, which I'm going to discuss to you in the next few slides. So information presented in tabs of medical records. So we will we expect that there will be a, a, a what we call EMR, okay, that will be presented as part of the, the, the informations. The question set. So in the case study, we will be having six questions in each set. So meaning to say there will be three case studies and each case study, there will be six questions each that aims to measure the six cognitive skills in order. So what are these this six cognitive skills in order? So these are your recognized cues, analyze cues, prioritizing hypothesis, generating solutions, taking actions and evaluating outcomes. So for this standalone questions, we will be dealing with single question that our goal is or our focus on what we call specific cognitive levels of the clinical judgment measurement model. So, okay. So as we go along, what are these clinical functions or six functions of clinical judgment? This is basically the nursing process. But rather... But rather, these are a further breakdown into six um, critical steps which the nurse should utilize in, in each time they render uh, nursing care. So we will start, start first on recognizing cues. So what matters most with my patient? So what is, what is really happening on my patient? So based on the information presented to you, you will have to analyze the cues. So what, is, what, is the, what does it mean? What are these um, cues mean? So after analyzing the cues, you need to prioritize the hypothesis. So where, does, wh where should I start? So after having this information, what should I do? So from this, you need to generate solution going on, moving on to step four, generate solution. What can I do about this? So after identifying the interventions, possible interventions that you need to perform, you need to take action. You will implement then, okay, the, the, the action. And after implementing the action, you need also to evaluate the outcomes. So in evaluating the outcomes, you need to satisfy yourself. Did I help? Did this intervention help my patients? If not, so you need to, like, again, um, um, finding ways to, to, to address the problem of the patient or problems of the patient. 
So standalone question comprises 10% from that 25% new questions in the NGN. So this is a single question based on information presented in an electronic medical record. So as I had mentioned, you will encounter definitely um, a real patient condition. So patient condition coming from the uh, EMR or electronic medical records. So in standalone question, it has a stated diagnosis or an implied diagnosis already. So you have to include the clinical information for a specific client. You need to, in, to understand what are the clinical informations that is presented with the use of this EMR and provide components that require the entry-level nurse to make one or more clinical decisions. So aside from standalone questions, you will also be encountering some of these um, formats, such as traditional items, which focus on multiple choice, the, the normal SATA or your select all that apply questions, the ordered response, fill in the blanks, graphics, exhibit. So extended multiple response, extended drug and drop. We also ha be having closed rationale, the closed rationale or table for a drop-down type, your matrix grid for your multiple response or your multiple choice question, your highlight or enhanced hotspot, your text and table, and the focus of my discussion for tonight, which is about a clinical judgment model standalone question, which is we will be dealing more on bow tie and trend items, but specifically bow tie. Okay, so what is this trend item types? So a trend item type is basically a any NGN item type that is mentioned to you a while ago. So you will be you will be uh, presented with different tabs of information that is trended over time. So what are these tabs information that you have to see your, that you can see in this uh, particular um, type of question? You will be presented, for example, with vital signs lab result, and also nurses' notes. So from these tabs, you will have to gain information about the condition of the patient. So you will utilize these tabs in order for you to analyze the condition. What is the, the, the present condition might, might, might the patient is experiencing now so that you will be able to effectively utilize these six critical uh, judgment skills in order to find solution and in order also to address the, the problem of the patient. So all you have to do, if ever you will encounter this type of question, you need to look at the tab information. You need to go on reading all the tabs information and recognize and analyze the trend. As we all know from this type of, of test, NGN item type. So it is being trended. The information is trended over time. So I want you to read all the tabs carefully and analyze each in tab for you to gain knowledge or information about what is the stem of the question or what is the, the, the real problem all about. So what is going on? Why is the, this trend significant? So is there a significant change from, for example, if my patient has been in the PACU or in post-anesthesia care unit after underwent a particular surgery after an hour staying in the PACU, these are the, the informations uh, presented. So is there a significant changes that might beneficial for me to anticipate whether there is what a problem with my patient? So you will be asked one question. So it focuses on any or all of the cognitive level. It can be analyzed. It can be uh, uh, um, uh, formulating hypotheses. It can be implementing. Okay, it can be any NGN type. Whether the question is about your your task is to highlight the 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 condition that uh, says that the patient, for example, is experiencing this particular condition your matrix or your question about multiple choice. So, okay. So this example, so this example shows you a trend. So as we, as I have mentioned a while ago, you will present it with different tabs. So in this case, you will have two tabs, your nurse's notes and your vital signs. So the question here is on the top. This is usually a, a basic um, statement that you will 
you will be receiving in the actual NCLEX exam. And the other part of the paper of, or this side, you will notice an arrow here. So an arrow here represent usually the trend in or what we call the lead in. So meaning to say the lead in gives you information about what is your task. What should I do or what is the question wanted you to answer? So before moving on here, so lead in on the right side, I want you to go over and read first this information on the tabs that is being presented. So from the word itself, trending, you'll have to read everything. For example, the patient started at the, the preoperative unit at 8 a.m. Then at 11.30, the patient is transferred to post-anesthesia care unit. And at 1200, the patient is now transferred to surgical unit. So your task is to read every information here, read everything from the preoperative unit, then followed at 11.30 and 12 and analyze everything. Okay, so from there, jump in on, on the right side. So with the use of this lead in arrow on the right side, the question here is about the nurse is contributing to the client plan of care. Select the three potential nursing intervention the nurse should anticipate for the care of the client. So meaning to say from this, this, this question, you are asking to answer three anticipated nursing intervention out of this information, hence the word trending, okay? So another, so you'll be also presented with the vital signs. You need to go over with and analyze this information from the preoperative, post-anesthesia, and surgical unit. Analyze the changes that occur from temperature, pulse rate, RR, blood pressure, and pulse oximetry, and please, do not rush, but rather analyze everything and see to it that whether the informations or the values are, are, are somehow there are significant changes, okay? Because you are answering here the trend question. So again, the question is presented on the right. That is the uh, trend type of question. Now, let me go ahead and discuss you this bow tie. So our discussion will focus on the bow tie. So if you will notice from the word itself, bow tie, the task of the examinee for the, the bow tie is one to be able for you to understand or an, uh, identify the potential condition your patient is experiencing. Your answer should be placed. You will drag your answer and you will place it at the center. So after identification, identifying the potential condition, another task will be you need to analyze the condition. You need to make use of the cues to recognize the cues, analyze this um, information to be able for you to identify two actions to take. And you need to select those, um, uh, those actions below and you need to drag it here. So meaning to say, without uh, um, going deeper on uh, what we call how many um, correct answers should I uh, expect to, 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 to have if I correctly answer the question in bow tie. So definitely there are five questions, five, uh, rather five uh, answers to Two for action to take, one for potential condition, and one and two for parameters to monitor. And mind you guys, the bow tie is the only trend um, uh, um, standalone question in NCLEX that measures the six clinical judgment model. So unlike with the, with the case study, yes, it, it, it asks the six clinical, uh, clinical uh, um, judgment model, but the manner it was presented, it was being asked in the in the in the question is in progressing. So unlike with the bow tie, you need to uh, to to perform first the, the first three steps, then um, identify the potential condition, then you need to identify the actions and parameter with the steps five and six in that clinical judgment model. Okay, so the bow tie, as I have said. Here is a perfect uh, um, um, visuals of the bow time 
bow tie item format as presented in the NCSBN. So you need to identify two actions to take. One condition, most likely my patient or your patient is experiencing and parameters to monitor. Okay, so now we will be dealing on, on approaches on how to effectively manage completing this bow tie. So remember guys, in bow tie, you always think of, the, of what we call the, the NCP. So as we all know, um, during the, the clinical uh, days, our um, clinical nursing school, we are tasked to make a nursing care plan. Basically, the bow tie um, stems from this idea. So you need to identify the problems and you need to identify appropriate um, interventions in order for you to, to, um, to address the situation. So with the use of these subjective cues, with the use of these objective cues, utilize this information for you to make a nursing care plan. Basically, that is bow tie. So what to expect in bow tie? You will be um, encountering this int introductory sentence. Introductory sentence, which is located on the upper left portion of the, 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 the question. So on the right, so you will have a question, encounter question on the right, and also multiple pages, as I've mentioned, with EMR. So the case are presented on the left. Okay, and this is what we call the bow tie now. So all you have to do first, what are the steps to do? Read the tabs. As I mentioned, it is very significant, imperative. One should read the tabs, all the tabs. Read and open the tabs for you to, to, to gain information. Okay, then read the stem. So what is the, the stem of the question? Okay, you'll be expected that there are five options. That is position on the left side, five options which is located on the right side, and four options which is located, which are located at the middle. So what, what are these? So we will be dealing with that um, for the next few slides. So your target is to drag and drop format. So as I mentioned, as soon as you, 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 you selected a, an answer, you drag it and you drop it to an appropriate box until you complete the five major boxes there. So it is uh, said to be you also get five points if ever you, you, you have to uh, you, you answer correctly. So all targets must be utilized for the examinees to move forward. So meaning to say, if ever you don't have any idea about how to answer, you will sort out with like a guest because the computer will not allow you to move to the next question without ensuring that all the boxes are completed. So you will get five maximum points and Okay, another important thing to remember, it is a color coded. So don't worry, it is color coded so that you will not you will not be uh, misled with all the options. But mind you, you cannot use the options on the left to answer options, to answer questions on the right and so on. You cannot use options on the right side to answer um uh, questions in the left side. So it doesn't work like that. So hence, it is color-coded to, to, to give you an um, idea on where should you place directly your answer. So a condition's most likely experiencing or your potential conditions uh, is positioned at the center, two actions to take on the left, and two parameters to monitor on the right. So the bow ties have one or more EFR tabs. So you can get nurses' notes, History and physical assessment, laboratory results, vital signs, INO, admission notes, progress notes, medications, diagnosis, diagnostic results, or flow sheet. Some of, uh, of, of the question might, you will get nurse's note plus vital signs, or you may also have nurse's note plus medications, nurse's note plus progress notes plus medications. So... The good thing about it, 
all of the informations are presented to you. All you have to do is to open all the tabs and read all the information for you to get the information. Because if you don't have the sufficient information, you cannot effectively answer the bow tie. That is uh, how the, this um, bow tie uh, runs. Okay? So remember, in order for you to move forward in this examination, all targets or response items must be filled with tokens. So what are these? So tokens are the placeholder of the response. So for this example, I took it from New World Nursing. So this is the bow tie. Okay. So options are located below. So actions to take here, as I have mentioned, five, one, two, three, four. Usually there are five and four potential conditions and five parameters. All you have to do is to select two actions here. For example, I choose loosen restraint. I drag it and place it here on top. And I choose reorient the client. I, I drag it and choose it uh, and, and place it here, drop it here. And for the potential condition, let's say I intend to select neurovascular impairment. But the first thing to do is to identify first the potential condition for you to effectively analyze what actions are appropriate to do and also what actions or parameters that I need to, to do. From this example, the target here are these five boxes and the tokens are here below. So you need to, to give tokens in order for you to satisfy the target. So meaning to say, they're asking you five questions before you can move on to the next question. So if ever you will not be able to, to, to answer it, some of, of the students will, uh, for example, um, guess, but worry no more. So it is easier to, to, to understand the bow tie. So, so that's why we're dealing, we are discussing it today. And also... If you apply in, if you if you part of, you will be part of the IPAS Online Review and Mentoring Academy. Definitely, we are hundred and one uh, ready. We are uh, ready for this transition. So we really, we holistically prepare our students by giving them a lot of drills and a lot of examples, and we make a a continuous training for our students so that they will they will effectively uh, answer or they will, uh, they will be ready for this NGN transition. Okay, how to score the bow tie? So the scoring for the bow tie is usually zero or one scoring. So meaning to say there are five possible points for each bow tie, one point for the condition. If you, you identify the right answer, if you're going to, to identify two correct answers for actions and two points for parameters, you'll get five points. However, you will not receive any deduction if you endorse incorrect answer. Okay? You will not receive, I'm sorry for this uh, uh, wrong spelling here, you will not receive a um, uh, minus point if you selected a wrong answer. Because, as I've mentioned, this bow tie measures the six clinical judgment skill. So, it it differs from the it differs from from other types of uh, examination. Okay, so what are the sample problem? Okay, so let me just go on and give you a particular condition that is being asked. Okay, the usual case question that's being asked in NCLEX. So let's move on discussing this stroke or what we call the uh, um, cerebrovascular accident. So let's discuss this. Very short, and after this, we will apply the learning out of understanding this stroke in answering a specific bow tie. Okay, so let me go ahead. So what is this stroke or your cerebrovascular accident? So I want you to think of the three important uh, different terms, important terms. Oxygen-rich blood, blockage or bleeding and death of the brain cells. So what happened during stroke, there will be a block within the, any of the blood vessels that supplies the brain with oxygen-rich blood, okay? So there are two reasons. It can be a block in the, uh, in the uh, blood vessels or it might 
there will be a bleeding that is happening. So because of perfusion is impeded and the brain being the most important uh, tissues that requires a constant supply of oxygen-rich blood, brain cells will start to die if ever will not be able to um, uh, uh, um, take action immediately, to take uh, action with, with regards to the patient, most especially if we, if we uh, determine that your patient or my patient or the patient is experiencing stroke or cerebrovascular uh, accident. So most of the time, um, the most common type of um, CVA is ischemic stroke, which, is, which happens due to a clot. So meaning to say there is a block within the blood vessels that supplies the brain with oxygen-rich blood. So the most common cause, it might be an embolism. Embolism, which causes like due to, let's say the patient is a known uh, with atrial fibrillation or atrial uh, fleur uh, condition. So I mean to say for the longest time your patient is experiencing atrial fibrillation or atrial fleur. This predispose your patient of having a ischemic uh, attack. Hence, the type of stroke is known as embolic stroke or in the other way around, thrombosis. For example, your patient is uh, a known hypertensive so with hypertension, your patient is suffering from atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries because of uh, too much or high level density lipoprotein. For example, your patient is hyperlipidemic, for example. So your patient might encounter or might be having thrombotic stroke. Okay, so that, that might be a, 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 a condition. So for your hemorrhagic stroke, the bleeding in the brain due to a break in the blood vessels. So what are the causes? So causes might be aneurysm. So the patient for a longest time has a uncontrolled hypertension, older age, aging or blood vessels. Okay, aging of the blood vessels. So remember, the brain cells are very sensitive. Within five minutes, the cells start to become damaged and become irreversible. So meaning to say, in dealing with stroke or uh, cerebrovascular accident, time is of essence. Time is very significant to the stroke or CBA patients. So let's go ahead, passing through this brain function. So we also need to determine the different functions of the brain so that we can effectively understand the brain functions and what each of the, of the part within the brain that controls some of the specific process within the body. So for example, here we have your frontal. So your frontal controls the thinking, speaking, memory, movement, parietal, the language and touch, your temperature, hearing, learning and feelings, occipital for our vision and also for color perception. We have your brain stem, which deals for your breathing, heart rate and temperature, and your cerebellum, which focus on um, balance and coordination. So in stroke, it tends to affect one side of the body. So analyzing this idea will give us deter, uh, information about the clinical presentation of our patient. For example, on the right side, the right side controls the creative, okay? The right side is what we call our creative side. So it controls our emotion, our solving day-to-day -day problems, our reasoning, judgment, memory, and it controls the red left side of the body, okay? So what are the expect, expected, okay? Signs and symptoms, if the patient has a, a problem or an, uh, the affectation is the right side of the brain, the patient might be having a left side hemiplegia. So your patient has a confusion, okay? For example, that is the reason why you need to, to, to ask, for example, if the patient is suspected of having stroke, you ask the patient, what is your name? Can you tell me um, where you are right now? Okay. Can you tell me your birthday, for example? Because here you are asking, you are uh, analyzing, you are assessing 
the the you, whether your patient has a confusion, particularly you're asking about the date, time, and the place. You need to say the orientation of the patient with these categories, date, time, and place. And your patient cannot recognize faces or person's name. Your patient might uh, lose depth of perception and trouble staying on topic when talking. Okay, so another thing, your patient will be having unilateral neglect or your left side neglect. So your patient might experiencing this hemi, uh, hemi, hemiplegia, hemianopsia, uh, hemi which is, for example, during um, um, eating, let's say you give a tray to the patient then the food is placed in a plate. Then you notice your patient like only um, eating the, the other half of the food, for example. Let's say the right side or the left side. So it, it determines that your patient is having a hemianopsia. Okay? So on the left side, this is what we call the logical side. This controls our speaking ability, our writing, reading, math skills, and analyzing information and planning. So what are the expected if this is damaged? So your patient might be having hemiplegia, okay? Hemiplegia on the right. Your patient will, will, will also um, exhibit trouble formulating uh, words and comprehending uh, words. So in general, the medical term given is aphasia. So your patient will be having trouble understanding written texts. Your patient might be having um, writing, difficulty writing, or uh, um, they will ha be having um, problems with the, uh, using a ball pen or the pen and write. And whenever they write, they can you cannot understand the letters. It's really incom incompre incomprehensible. Okay, that is what we call agraphia and issues with seeing on the right side and also impaired math skills. Okay, so what are the risk factors for your uh, cerebrovascular accident? So remember this, pneumonics, strokes happen. So if you notice this one, two, three with this highlighted red uh, um, asterisk here are the most common predisposing factors for a patient with stroke. So smoking, your pa patient is uh, with high blood pressure or hypertension, patient with atherosclerosis or hyperlipidemia. And also another important predisposing factors is your rhythm changes. For example, your patient is having a atrial uh, flur or atrial fibrillation. So how, uh, how we know if the patient has a rhythm um, changes. For example, if you are presented with an ECG, there will be a, a what we call the absence of P wave and also your irregular rhythm. So further, your atrial fibrillation is divided into three based on the heart rate. It can be slow, moderate, or rapid ventricular response atrial fibrillation. So these are the things that you need to, to, to also understand that this might be a predisposing factors for the stroke. And one danger about if my, your patient is having a, a atrial fibrillation is the idea that the heart is fibrillating when the heart is quivering and fibrillating, so the formation of clot is uh, possible or likely to happen. So that clot coming from the coming from the from the heart will go on make uh, make travels around the body, and for example, it lodges into a small capillary or small small artery within the brain, and that. Uh, um, block the, the, the perfusion within the brain because of what we call this thrombus formation. Okay. So oral contraceptives, the kin, it runs in the family, excessive weight, senior citizen, as we all know, hypertension, as I mentioned, atherosclerosis, physical activity, previous transient ischemic attacks, and elevated blood sugars. Okay. This is also one uh, in, important uh, thing to remember. In, 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 um, in management of stroke, elevated blood sugar, 
especially during the point of uh, contact to the hospital, for example, you need to check immediately the, the, the sugar because the sugar, the sugar, uh, um, blood sugar is often, remember this, blood sugar is often elevated in acute stroke and higher admission glucose levels are associated with larger lesions, greater mortality, and um, poorer functional outcome. So especially, as we all know, in stroke, in ischemic stroke in particularly, the most important uh, um, mode of treatment is um, the patient will, will, will receive thromboly uh, thrombolysis. Okay. And if the patient is a known hyperglycemic or if the patient is a known um, diabetic and we, we do not control the, the elevation of the blood sugar, remember that it, it has believed that it is associated with increased risk of hemorrhagic transformation of in part. So meaning to say, if the patient is presented into the hospital with ischemic stroke and the blood blood sugar is not controlled well and the patient receives thrombo, uh, thrombolytics, for example, or the TPA, if the, if the blood sugar continues to rise and we do not institute measure to control the blood sugar, the likelihood of the infarct, okay, the ischemic, inf uh, ischemic stroke can transform into what we call hemorrhagic stroke. So, here, I am stressing out the role of sugar. Okay. So the National Institute of Health Stroke Scale Score, or the NIHSS, provided us information to effectively uh, utilize, especially in the case of patient who is suffering from stroke. So we, we normally use the FAST, okay? Stands for this F for the face, A for the arm and leg, S for the speech or T for time. So what are you going to do with regards to the face? So there will be an even smile, facial droop or numbness, okay? There will be a vision disturbance with the patient. Ask the patient to, to, to raise his or her arm. So there will be a weakness, arm and legs. So there will be a, a, an even smile. Um, a, a, an even smile is actually here on the face, okay? The facial droop numbness, um, this uh, vision disturbances, actually. Usually for the A here, it stands for the arm drip and the leg. So meaning to say, if, they ask your, if you ask your patient to, 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 to raise his or her arm, then you see that there is an uneven. He or she cannot make a stable that his or her arm is Racing, let's say, because of weakness, that is what we call the arm trip here. The S, ask the patient to speak or repeat the sentence after you. Okay, if your patient is having trouble speaking, your, your, your patient is, is having a slurred speech, your patient is talking into inappropriate words and answers that are not relevant to your question. Okay. So there will be a big question mark about, about it. And definitely time is crucial. So you need to activate and call 911 right away. Okay. So there are other important stroke terms. So we have your aphasia, which is unable to speak. Receptive aphasia, which is unable to comprehend speech, especially if your patient has a damage with Bernick's area. Broca's area result in expressive aphasia. So we also have mixed aphasia, which is a combination of two or more aphasia and a global aphasia, which deals, which happens when there will be a complete inability to understand speech or to produce it. Okay. Another, there might be a dysarthria. You will be unable to hear speech clearly due to a weak muscles and hard to understand the patient's speech. Okay, it may be slurred, for example. Apraxia, the patient can perform, can perform voluntarily movements. Winking, for example, moving arms to scratch an itch and even through muscles. Okay, even though muscles function is normal. 
Your patient might be experiencing agraphia or the loss of ability to write, alexia, which is the loss of ability to read, okay, because the patient doesn't understand or recognize the words. Your patient might experience agnosia, which is he or she doesn't understand the sensation or recognize known objects or people. Your patient might experience also dysphagia, which is an issue of swallowing. Okay. With regards to dysphagia, I want you to, to remember when the patient is suspected of stroke, please, as much as possible, NPO immediately. Nothing per orem. Do not give anything by mouth unless there will be a comprehensive dysphagia screening test. Because the problem with the patient with um, uh, cerebrovascular accident is what we call aspiration. And that aspiration may lead to what we call aspiration pneumonia. So until such time that the, that the patient has been tested significantly with this dysphagia screening test, and if the patient has a problems with swallowing, please never give anything by mouth. So, meaning to say, your patient is expected to be uh, to be uh, uh, inserted with a a um, NGT because the food, the medications will be um, uh, delivered through the. Um, nasogastric tube, or if the patient has already an access, let's say your patient has a central venous line, your patient has a peripheral uh, line, venous line already, so you have to give the medication through this uh, um, access. So hemianopsia, so a limited vision in half of the visual field, or what we call the partial blindness and hemiparesis, which is weakness on the side of the body. So what is the gold standard with identification of, of stroke? So the gold standard of which is your CT scan. So why is it CT scan? There are two options. One can, 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 can uh, determine it with the use of CT scan or one can determine it with the use of MRI. So what is this MRI or CT scan all about? So why is it that the CT scan might be the, the gold standard for um, um, identifying the stroke? Why? Because not all hospitals has MRI. So meaning to say, time is of essence. So we need to send immediately the patient to, to a radiologic department for him or her to have this test done right away, the CT scan. So remember that in CT scan, we need, we, we need to perform the CT scan within 25 minutes of arrival to stroke center. And within 45 minutes, Radiologists should read the CT scan. Okay, should read the CT scan. So if ever the, the plate is there already, so how are we going to identify whether my patient is having a, a hemorrhagic stroke? Because knowing whether the type of stroke is hemorrhagic or ischemic, that could delineate the next intervention because the intervention of what we call thrombolysis is only applicable for a patient who is diagnosed with ischemic stroke. And that is a no-no or what we call an intervention that cannot be done if the patient is diagnosed with hemorrhagic stroke for that matter. Hence, CT scan is a gold standard. So what do we expect? So there will be a positive light ops. So what, we, what, 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 do, what do we need by this? A positive light, light ops, which means the scan here, look at the, uh, the, the plates here, the scan image with hyperdense okay, areas of bleeding. So in this example, this is a hyperdense area of bleeding, making the patient ineligible for what we call TPA. Okay, so the other way around is your MRI. So um, if the patient is lucky, so the, the stroke center has a CT scan or MRI, so it's, uh, it, it's, um, it's uh, let's say, up to the uh, doctor um, what type of, of, of test he or she choose if CT scan and MRI is available. So again, without the MRI, the gold standard is CT scan. Okay, so treatment. Treatment for CV is everything. 
So TPA, the tissue plus minigen act act activator is the only is the only acceptable treatment for type of stroke which is ischemic. So meaning to say, if the patient is hemorrhagic stroke, diagnosed with hemorrhagic stroke, so meaning to say, TPA is not an option. So what is this uh, TPA? So your, your TPA dissolves the clot within the blood vessels by activating the protein that causes fibrinolysis. So meaning to say, in, in tissue plasminogen activator, it converts the plasminogen to plasmin. So your plasmin is your, the major enzyme that breaks down the clot. So as I mentioned, treatment is everything, meaning to say there, are, there is what we call golden rule here. You can, you can perform, you can administer only the TPA within three hours from the onset of stroke symptoms. Three hours from the onset of stroke symptoms, meaning to say during the time that the nurse is gathering um, um, information, asking questions about the relatives. For example, the patient is presented that because you cannot ask the, the patient when did when, when this um, symptom starts because the patient, because of the presented idea already, cannot articulate, cannot answer effectively your question. So you can ask the significant others. For example, the daughter of the patient, the, the husband or the wife of the patient, or something significant others that uh, whom brought their patient to the emergency department, for example. So it can be given 3 to 4.5 hours after the onset if criteria is met. So what are these criteria? So CT of the head reveal negative for hemorrhage. The labs uh, within normal limits, glucose, 60 to 100, for example, INR. So what is this example? 0 0.9 to um, 0 0.92 to 1.8. That is the thera therapeutic level for INR. So meaning to say if the INR reveals that that is more than 3.5 seconds, meaning to say that is a prolonged bleeding. Okay, platelets. Let's say your platelets has within 200,000 to 400,000. Okay, microliter. So it should be these things might be within the normal limits. So the BP needs to be controlled. Okay, your systolic blood pressure should be less than 185 systolic or millimeters mercury. And your diastolic blood pressure should be less than 110. However, there is what we call hyper, uh, permissive um, hypertension. So this permissive hypertension is something that we allow somehow the elevated blood pressure to occur to the patient because, because of this pressure, it actually uh, gives the opportunity to supply the, 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 the tissue with um, oxygen-rich blood because of the pressure. However, with this um, permissive hypertension, we need to see or we need to make sure that the systolic and the diastolic with, should fall with this. So I mean to say, we, we can say that the patient is hypertensive if the systolic blood pressure is 180 or the diastolic pressure is 100. This is something that we, we, we want to make sure that the patient vital signs or specifically the blood pressure should be with this level or what we call uh, permissive hypertension. Okay. As I've mentioned a while ago, glucose controlled is important. Glucose controlled is important, especially if the patient receives thrombolytics, thrombolytics. Why? Because uncontrolled hyperglycemia is the, the factor that causes this infarct, ischemic infarct, to jump into what we call hemorrhagic type of stroke. So meaning to say your glucose control should always be checked as part of the point of care. Okay. And the patient is not receiving heparin or other types of anticoagulants. Remember during the time, this is one important thing to remember during the time that the patient is is uh, receiving a, a, a infusion for this TPA. Remember, we need to check the vitals Q15 minutes for the first one hour of infusion. And then Q1 after the infusion ends, 
And usually the Glasgow Como scale or the neurovascular check should be done Q30 for the first one hour, Q, uh, Q, uh, Q15 for the first one hour, Q30 for the next uh, hour, and Q1 for the succeeding hours. That is the golden rule for that. Okay, so the nurse's priority to remember, okay, with your stroke is to monitor the bleeding, okay, because what, what, should, what should the pa patient receive is definitely anti, uh, um, let's say, thrombolytics. So the patient is predisposed definitely to, to bleeding. So you need to ensure that you also check and monitor for the bleeding. As I've mentioned, neuro check round the clock. Vital signs, specifically your blood pressure, especially for your patient who has a uncontrolled hypertension. Again, for the labs, okay, priority is your glucose level, definitely, because of that particular um, rationale or the, the reasons why you should have to, to, to ensure that the glucose level is controlled. Preventing injury, you need to ensure that the patient must be in bed rest. Avoid unnecessary vinipunctures and avoid IM injection. So meaning to say, if the patient is already uh, diagnosed with, with stroke upon, for example, receiving of thrombolytics, you should need to establish at the point of contact within the ER department, for example, your patient should be, should have, let's say, this access, the, sen the, the venous access already. Because once the patient receives already your thrombolysis, we need to, to ensure that as much as possible, we minimize that the patient uh, will be receiving, let's say, benefunctures or you, you will withdraw blood, okay? Or you give medication to IM because we really, we really want to make sure that we mit minimize the chance that the patient having a bleeding. And of, of course, immediate uh, admission to the intensive care unit or cardiac telemetry unit or the CVICU unit, then the patient should be monitored continuously and might, should be hooked to, okay, to um, cardiac monitor to determine the, the rhythm of the patient. And of course, you need to give the patient automatically oxygen because what is the problem with the patient in a stroke? So the loss of perfusion, vital perfusion to the brain because of, for example, bleeding or, or because of what we call block within any of the arteries that supply oxygen-rich blood to the brain, okay? So, yes, it is imperative that oxygen should be given to the patient, okay? So you need to assess with the NIH stroke scale. So these are the ranges. So it aims to assess the 11 areas, Level of consciousness, gaze, visual, facial palsy, motor function and extremities, cranial nerves, and monitor bowel and bladder functions. Okay. So communication is the key. Because in patients with stroke, it doesn't mean that they have a uh, deficit or mental problems. The reason why they have deficit with communication because of the implication of, or, or what we call the affectations uh, in, in a particular area within the brain. So we need also to understand this Wernix and Broca's area because it gives us opportunity to effectively intervene, to effectively care for my patient. For example, in temporal lobe, this is where Wernix area is located. So your patient will be having or will be uh, showing problems related to receptive aphasia. He or she will be unable to comprehend speech, okay? Will be unable to comprehend speech. So this is, this is what we call the Center for Language Comprehension. So meaning to say, what are the interventions that I need to perform? So when you speak to the patient, you make use of the short phrases. You use gesture or point while giving a command. Be patient and not expect the patient response fast to you. And also you need to remove distractions. If the frontal area is the subject of the affectation, this is where the Broca's area is located. So if the patient has a problem with the frontal area, this is the area where language is being produced. So expressive aphasia might be the problem with our patient. So what are the interventions? So you, you have to, to give so much patient to your patient. 
please give time and opportunity for your patient to express what he or she wanted to say. And please do not rush, of course. Be direct and simple when asking questions and give options so that your patient can select, okay? And also communicate with the use of dry erase board or what we called in Joint Commission International uh, a communication board, okay? You, you may also want to offer it to your patient so that the patient can understand uh, what you are trying to, to, uh, to say. Okay, so now let's apply what you have learned by incorporating these information to what we call bow tie. Okay. Now, so what are the tips again and strategies in answering bow tie? So using this six clinical judgment model, you need to anticipate the following and you need to use these steps in order for you to answer the bow tie. One, you need to recognize the cues, whether that is normal or abnormal. All you have to do is you need to read the information in the scenario and recognize which findings are relevant. That is your first step. Second step, make connections to determine what these relevant findings mean and what condition the client may be experiencing. This is something to do with analyzing cues. With, the, with, with these informations available, with this data, with these vital signs, with this um, history of my patient, with these clinical symptoms the patient is exhibiting. So you need to analyze these things, information for you to understand what might your patient is experiencing or what might be the possible potential condition that your patient might be experiencing in the future. Hence, I'd like again to reiterate to you that the bow tie is the only standalone question that can measure simultaneously the six clinical judgment model because of these steps, okay, that I, I need you to, 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 to um, um, Im implement. So identify the client's immediate problems, that is your prioritizing, prioritize, prioritize rather, hypothesis and identify your possible solutions. Then answer the bow tie. As I've mentioned a while ago, in the left side, you need to, to, to select the actions at the bottom. You drag it and drop it on the left side. So you are asking two answers. On the right side is your parameters to measure. You will be required to answer two, uh, two answers, yes, to, to give two answers or responses. Then you need to identify possible solution to address the client's needs or generate solution, determine what is likely the cause of issue, the appropriate actions to take, and parameters to monitor once action has been taken. So that is your evaluate outcomes. Now, let's go on uh, giving you an important example. I think we are uh, about to finish our discussion. This is actually an example taken directly from the NCSBN as part of uh, the training for, for all of us. So I intend to use it for this, uh, for this reason so that our students can understand what bow tie, uh, the dynamics of bow tie. So as I have mentioned ago, a while ago, there will be a sentence here at the top. So you will you have to see on the right, right side of this um, um, slide, this is the bow tie, okay, the tokens and the targets. Diba? So these are again the tokens, and the side here are the targets. So your targets is to identify two action, identify one condition your patient is experiencing, identify parameter to monitor, two parameters to monitor. So this arrow here shows you the lean-in. So meaning to say the lean-in gives you the idea on what you should do. So what is the question here? So the nurse in the emergency department is caring for a 75-year-old female client. So there are three types that is being given to you, provided to you. You have your nurse's notes, your history and physical, and your laboratory results. So as I had mentioned a while ago, you need to go over, read all these information in these three tabs to be able for you to have an idea. Okay, so let's go ahead, read the nurse's notes on 1215. Your client 
the nurses in the emergency department is caring for a 79-year-old female client. So in the nurse's notes revealed, in 1215, the client presents with right-sided ptosis. Okay, right-sided ptosis. So what do you mean by ptosis? Ptosis when your upper eyelid drops over the eye. So upper, uh, upper eyelid dro droops over the eye. Okay, that is your ptosis. And facial drooping, right-sided hemiparesis, and expressive aphasia. Your client's adult child reports that the client recently had influenza. Okay. On assessment, skin is warm and dry. Lung sounds are clear. Apical pulse is irregular. Okay. So on the assessment, skin is warm and dry. So let's let's think of what we called here um issue in, in terms of hydration, for example. Lung, uh, lung sounds are clear, so it's normal. Apical pulse is irregular. Okay, so irregular, let's assume that the heart rate is, is uh, let's say, more than 100, for example. Irregular. Okay, so bowel sounds are active in all quadrants. This is normal. Client is incontinent of urine two times in emergency department. Should we, should we think that this incontinence of urine two times in the emergency department is somehow expected to a patient which is 79 year old? Okay, I think this is expected that the patient that's 79 year old can be incontinent of urine because of the loss of bladder tone. Okay, so next, um, adult child reports that the client is typically continent of urine. The capillary refill of three seconds, that is normal. Peripheral pulse is palpable of two plus. This is actually okay. Vital signs T 97.5, temperature 36.4 is normal. Pulse, okay. 126, so somehow above the normal. RR is 18 because uh, um, 12 to 20 is a normal. BP, 188 over 90. This is somehow elevated. This is somehow um, um, uh, um, hypertensive. Let's say for this matter, your patient is hypertensive as, as he or she is presented in the ER. Pulse oximetry at room air is 90%. Okay, 90. So usually... Optimal is 95 to 100 as much as possible. For, but that is somehow um, partly normal because that is in room air. Okay. So now, read the history and physical. So history and physical, in neur neurological uh, um, determination, your findings, your patient had history of stroke two years ago. So somehow, stroke, okay. Two, in cardiovascular, your patient is a known hypertensive. Your patient has is a known with, with uh, um, uh, heart problems or heart rhythm problem, which is your atrial fibrillation. And your patient is also hyperlipidemic. For example, especially if this happens, if your patient is not really compliant with, with uh, for example, um, taking statins, for example, Okay, so gastrointestinal. So history of gastrointestinal bleeding within two months ago and endocrine history of diabetes mellitus type 2 for 30 years and immunological. Your patient had history of uh, um, uh, receiving influ influenza vaccine three weeks ago. So laboratory, let's go move on reading the laboratory results. So random serous glucose. Okay, your elderly, normal, is for, for 60 to 90 years old, is 82 to 115, or 4.6 to 6.4 millimole for, per liter. So your patient, as presented into the emergency department at 12.15, revealed a result of 76 milligram per deciliter, or 4.2 millimole per liter, which is based on the reference range, I can say that a patient here has a normal blood glucose level. Now, our task is to make use of this information in order for us to satisfy the, the bow tie. So now, given this idea, for example, if I'm going to highlight some of the most important thing, I should make use of this information, right-sided ptosis, facial drooping, 
right-sided hemiparesis, expressive aphasia. One. Another thing is your BP, 188 over 90. And another thing is your pulse rate of 128. Because these are, and your apical pulse is irregular. So these are the things that my thought that my patient is having this particular condition or currently experiencing this condition. So our task is to identify this potential condition. So with the information provided, with the strategies provided a while ago, I want you to look on at the center of this bow tie here below. For the potential condition, I need you to select. So usually, as I've mentioned, there are four options that will be provided to you. Your task is, is to select one based on this scenario. So based on this presentation of my patient, defi definitely can somebody can somebody ask from the from the viewers what potential condition might my patient is experiencing? Might be my patient con is condition is experiencing. Is anyone from the from the from the audience not in? Okay. So I can say here ischemic stroke. Okay. So I will drag I will drag the ischemic stroke and put it over here. Okay. I will drag the ischemic stroke and put it and drop here on the condition most likely experiencing. Now, my next step is my next uh, 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 my next thing to do is to take actions. So what are the two actions I needed to answer this ischemic stroke? Okay, what are the things I needed to implement? Okay, can you sell, can you choose? Okay, so I, I'm, I'm looking at my phone right now. So can someone can someone select one action to take in dealing with ischemic stroke? Okay. So definitely your one option would be administer oxygen at two liters by a nasal cannula. Because what is the problem? What is the nature of ischemic stroke? Okay, what is the nature of this problem? The problem with ischemic stroke is your the perfusion within the vital organs, specifically the brain, is impeded because there might be a block. So definitely the brain tissue is not able to, to, to get a oxygen-rich blood leading to this particular signs and symptoms. So if the patient is presented to emergency department, you need to give the patient definitely oxygen. Hook your patient immediately to oxygen at a normal uh, or in the safe uh, um, level, which is at least two liters by a nasal cannula because in United States, administration of oxygen is a prescription. We need to get a prescription. We need to give. We need to administer oxygen for this matter to our patient at, at the safest level. So definitely, two liters per minute is the safest one. And what is the the other other option to give? Okay, very good. So, uh, Miss Rachel Marple, thank you for participating, Miss Rachel. Uh, Mom Rachel um, told us that another step to do is to insert a peripheral venous access device. Definitely, because after the insertion of your peripheral venous access device, you have to, to, to anticipate that your patient eventually, once he or she is ruled out with ischemic stroke, will receive this therapy of TPA. And this TPA should only be given through infusion. So if the patient doesn't have any access, how are you going to, to give that medication? So assessing by uh, implementing this by insertion of the, the, the peripheral venous device is crucial to this condition. Now, all you have to do is to drop this administer oxygen to here, drop, and choose insert a peripheral venous access device and here, drop. And you now, your task is to move on the right side and go ahead, select parameters to monitor. Okay, so what are the parameters that we need to monitor for a patient who is suspected of ischemic stroke? Okay, what are the parameters? Okay, um, uh, Ms. Etil Avila Combes, 
answered um, neurologic status. Neurologic status is correct. Okay. Why is it neurologic status? With the use of your NIHS, okay, the Glasgow Coma Scale will give us the determination about whether our client is deteriorating or not. Definitely. Deteriorating or not. So mean to say, since we are on the bedside, understanding the if our patient follows command, okay, what is this, for example, um, the EBM, the eye response, the verbal, and the motor, and the patient, for example, presented a while ago at 1 a.m., let's say 1 p.m. in the afternoon with a Glasgow scale of at least, let's say, um, 10. Then after 15 minutes, you monitor for the GCS and your, your patient is already gone into GCS of 8. So something to do that your patient is having a, 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 a is gone into more problematic one because GCS result or reveal that your, your patient is deteriorating. So I mean to say you have to perform the neurologic status. And with regards to another question here, I, 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 I saw different responses from the group. So I saw some of the students answer ECG. Some of the students answer serum glucose level. So what are the answers here? What do you think is the answer here, guys? Can you help me? Okay. So remember, going back with the idea, going back to the idea, your patient is already a known uh, sufferer, sufferer of atrial fibrillation. So definitely, for the, for the longest time, I think your patient is... Uh, taking like uh, a pixaban, warfarin already, some uh, uh, anticoagulant medications that 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 uh, might be um, effective in dealing with this condition. So definitely, if the patient is unknown, suspected already of stroke, he or she is immediately um, admitted into the ICU or telemetry. And with regards to um, monitoring the patient, it is imperative that once the patient is uh, is admitted into the to these um, uh, areas, he or she should be immediately hooked to the cardiac monitor. So hooking at the cardiac monitor will give us opportunity regarding the, the rhythm of our patient, definitely. However, in this example, do you think that ECG is important monitor to, 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 um, to answer? What do you think? I think I already explained the reason. I think I already explained the reason. Guys, the answer here is serum glucose level. So what should I do? Our case is ischemic stroke already. So ischemic stroke is treated with PPA, okay, or thrombolytics. So as I have mentioned a while ago, as explained a while ago, okay, so we need to analyze, we need to ensure that the glucose level is controlled. If your patient is hyperglycemic, he need to control it because uncontrolled hyperglycemia may progress that idea your patient is having ischemic stroke to jumping into more problematic uh, type of stroke, which is known as your hemorrhagic stroke. So between the two, very important monitor parameter to monitor is your neurologic status and your serum glucose level. Okay. But I also read another research there. I also need uh, re read another research there, there and even speaking to a certified stroke nurse in United States. She told me that with these types, with these questions or, or in this question and these um, options for possible um, options the nurse should institute to monitor for this case. But another strategy to, to do, use the process of prioritization, of course. Prioritize what is, uh, prioritize the action that might help you with a better outcome. So a better outcome that will be your serum glucose level because we are anticipating the potential the, the possibility that the patient from ischemic stroke will progress into bleeding or hemorrhagic stroke, most especially if the patient is suffering from hyperglycemia. And remember during the concept of endocrine system, if the patient has a condition and is being admitted in, in the hospital, 
this stress or this uh, uh, pathology that is happening in the body might trigger the responses of our body to increase the secretion of the, the glucose level. If, and if we are not doing our best to monitor the glucose level, so definitely we are not controlling the hyperglycemia and we are predisposing the patient of jumping into a hemorrhagic stroke. So therefore, again, the, the answer for this will be, okay, this. Administer oxygen at 2 liters per minute by nasal cannula, insertion of IB, then your, your, your case is your ischemic stroke, parameters to monitor is your neurologic status and serum glucose level. So I think that, that ends our presentation for uh, strategies to effectively manage bow tie in NGN. I do hope that you uh, understand this uh, um, standalone question and you will be effectively answered in the, in the future if ever you will encounter this bow tie to effectively manage answering this question. Then again, guys, I'd like to reiterate to everybody that we, do, we cannot blame NCSBN from transitioning to the NGN because they really wanted to make to, to be sure that all nurses, uh, entry-level nurses, will safely and effectively uh, render quality care in the U.S. So this is something that we have to, 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 to look forward with because the NCSBN is really preparing us to be a safe and competent nurse in the future. So thinking that the NGN is hard is something that we cannot avoid. However, again, since I represent here IPAS, okay, online review of one of the success coaches and also nurse educators in collaboration, of course, with Kinetics, as I mentioned a while ago, we are doing our our best effort to prepare you, to help you, so that eventually you will earn this license, your goal of becoming USRN, and in the future, you can practice in either United States, in Australia, or in Canada. So on behalf of IPAS Mentoring uh, Academy, Online Review and Mentoring Academy, I'd like to invite everybody and, and, and inform you that IPAS is 101% ready for this transition for the NGN. So I am, uh, I am uh, um, inviting everyone to please um, uh, go and uh, apply and um, send yourself to IPAS review because we are 100% ready and we, and we will make sure that you will pass your NCLEX in the future. Thank you so much, Kinetics. For, for this uh, opportunity to, to, to give you um, um, a comprehensive uh, lecture about the bow tie and also helping our students to, to prepare for the NCLEX. So again, thank you so much and have a nice day. Thank you.